And good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Presented today by Meriwether and Tharp. Fun to be back here live again. Fun to be talking to you about Georgia, South Carolina on Saturday. So excited about the atmosphere around this game and the presence of some elite recruits is one of the things that I think adds a little spice to the uh, situation there on Saturday. So we're going to start today's show by talking about that. An interesting look at Carson Beck coming up. Terrence Edwards joins us here too. And we'll obviously deal with um, the the odd news as it relates to uh, former Georgia quarterback Stetson Bennett and his status of the LA Rams. We'll obviously cover that before our show is done today there as well. And we'll try to find some angles on some of the games here this week and admittedly this is not a you know rich and creamy deep slate of uh games for this particular weekend but we'll see if we can find some stuff to talk about as it relates to the rest of the sec here coming up in just a little bit we're really happy to have you with us fun show on tap let's get it rolling it is dog nation daily the daily podcast for georgia bulldogs fans we are go for three and 23 we're presented by meriwether and tharp and it begins right now Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Meriwether and Tharp, your source for Georgia divorce. Find them online at theatlantadivorceteam.com. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. Many of you know how much I love Georgia high school football, and I'm so proud of so many of the teams that we have here in our state, kind of in the Atlanta area where I live. One of my favorites, a program called Creekside. I just love their willingness to go play anybody, anywhere, anytime. There's a very tough brand of football player that comes from that Creekside program, coached by Maurice Dixon. I'm always thrilled anytime I get a chance to broadcast a Creekside game on television, on Peachtree TV with my friend Rusty Manziel, because Creekside always puts on a really good show. I just have a lot of respect for them and their players. And one of the guys uh, they have this year is a terrific defensive lineman. He is a giant of a man. His name is Makai Boyro. And in the case of Boro, you know, you're talking about a guy that is about 360 pounds, you know, kind of that classic nose guard, uh, space-eating defensive lineman, kind of a one-man run-stopping machine. And when he comes, you know, from a state like Georgia, a state that I love, high school football in, a program that I respect, I'm not going to lie to you. I really wanted Boro to come to Georgia. I really wanted Boro to be a part of this Georgia program. But credit to the program down – South, we don't like very much. Those lousy, stinking Gators. Uh, lousy, stinking Gators came into Atlanta. They won that recruiting battle for Makai Boro a couple of, what, months ago now. They won that battle. They got that commitment. And sometimes you have to admit, hey, you can't get every player that you want. Sometimes you wish you could, but you can't always. Even the lousy, stinking Gators, every now and then, they're going to win a recruiting battle. But what we also know is, is that Georgia doesn't take no very easily. Georgia doesn't just sit back and wave the white flag when it doesn't quite get the recruiting uh, win that it wants to get. Oftentimes, that makes Georgia fight even harder. In fact, last night on Before the Edge, is presented by Kroger, a recruiting show hosted by Jeff Sindel here on the Dog Nation video channels. Makai Boyro, the terrific defensive lineman from Creekside said that even after Boyro had made the commitment to Florida, that Georgia never stopped recruiting him. This is what Makai told Jeff about that last night. No, nah, they didn't let up at like all. You just they be was, committed, man. How stressful was that? Walk me through how hard day. that was. Coach Smart was on me. Coach uh, Scott was on me. Everybody. No, nah, they didn't let up at all. They was they was calling me, hitting me up every day. Coach Smart was on me. Coach uh, Scott was on me. Everybody. So, yeah, he says, Makai Boro over there says that did not let up at all, never gave up, never stopped fighting, never did anything like that. They just kept fighting. And guess what? There is a reason that a program like Georgia keeps fighting and keeps doing what it's doing uh, with a guy like Boro or any other recruit they never choose to give up on. They keep fighting for, keep making their pitch for, because oftentimes it's that second, it's that third shot, it's that fourth chance that sometimes actually results in what you want. Because guess what? That recruiting win that Florida supposedly had gotten from Kai Boyro a couple of months ago, well, apparently that's completely de- uh, uh, just disintegrated into thin air here now because this week, many of you are already aware of this, Boro, and I'll show you this on the screen, announced his decommitment from Florida. He says, I'd like to start by thanking the University of Florida and its staff for blessing me and my family with a great opportunity. He says, I appreciate Coach Spencer and Coach James for recruiting me, but after taking uh, talking to my family and the loved ones uh, and uh, lots of consideration, 
I am decommitting from the University of Florida. And that's all I need to know right there. If he's smart enough to realize that Gainesville, Florida is not the place for him, then Boro is smart enough for me. And many of you would say the same thing there on that. And the cool thing here is, fresh off a situation in which Boro said himself last night that Georgia hasn't stopped recruiting him, and after publicly announcing his decommitment from Florida, saying that he made that decision too hastily, and now he realizes he's going to open things back up again, Florida's not the right place for him. Many of you are also aware that Boro is going to be on campus for Georgia on Saturday when Georgia gets ready to host South Carolina. Now, we're going to get more in the next couple of minutes into the details around a lot of the other elite recruits who are also planning on taking their visits here to Georgia this weekend, unofficial visits, and being a part of a great atmosphere between the hedges. But what makes this fun is, is that not only does Georgia kind of set up for a wonderful atmosphere to beat up on an SEC foe like South Carolina on Saturday, as it does so, you can look down south and see those lousy, stinking gators down in Gainesville gnashing teeth and so angry about the fact that once again, it seems like Kirby Smart and Georgia have kind of gotten over on Florida. Once again, these head-to-head battles between the Gators and the Dogs, perhaps once again, it's Florida kind of taking it on the chin here. And you hate to hear this because you never want a young man to have to go through this, but it also gives you a little bit of a chuckle knowing how frustrated Florida fans remain with Georgia at all times. Boyro told Jeff Centel last night and before the hedges that, yeah, he has been hearing it from Florida fans. They are not happy with him because of a decommitment from the lousy stinking Gators and now a visit to Georgia. They are not happy with with him at all this is fun to hear here's a uh, makai from last night man it was it was a lot of hate got a lot of hate but i kind of zoned the hate out and just did, i did what i felt was good for me and i had a lot of support to help me through the hate got a lot of hate from florida fans now listen i don't want the young man to have to go through that because anybody in kind of a high school stage of life shouldn't have to hear that from grown adults but putting that aside <laughs> If Florida fans are that mad, that must mean that Georgia is doing something right. Now, I'm not going to guarantee you that Boy Rose is going to end up at Georgia. But I, hope, I hope that he does. I like what a guy like that brings to the table, big space-eating defensive lineman. But we know Michigan's going to be a factor here. You can, I guess, presume some other SEC teams are going to be a factor here, there as well. So I can't guarantee you that he goes to Georgia, but I can guarantee you this. The fact that he's at Georgia a couple of days after decommitting from Florida and the fact that Florida fans are all up in the mentions and all up in the uh, social media stuff mad about this, that just makes Saturday's environment for San Francisco that much sweeter. So that's kind of a fun thing to see. If they're this mad, then that must mean that Georgia and Kirby Smart are doing something right. We certainly get the impression that's the case. But in addition to that... Other big defensive linemen are expected to be in the building on Saturday, too. And the timing of this is also really interesting there as well. Aiden Breland uh, from out of modern day high, uh, high school out there in California, he has recently dropped his top three. And uh, Georgia's obviously uh, uh, you know, a, a part of this. We'll show you this on the screen here. Georgia along with what, uh, Miami? Do we have the uh, Breland screen grab here? Uh, maybe not. But, uh, yeah, there we go. Georgia, along with Miami and Oregon, as finalists uh, for uh, Breland here right now. Timing on this could not work out any better because fresh off kind of announcing that he's down to a th- uh, final three and what seemingly is sort of moving towards the end of his recruiting process here. Jeff Sintel also told us last night that in addition to the presence of Makai Boyro, you also get the presence of Aiden Breland in the building on Saturday there as well. Uh, this is what uh, Jeff Sintel said about that last night on before uh, he's that. visiting georgia on an unofficial visit he saw georgia in the in the summer in june on an official visit he also saw miami he also saw oregon he's cut his list down to a final three the dogs i've always kind of felt if the dogs get a visit for the south carolina game watch out there he's going to be in town he's got a final three it looks like he's getting closer and closer to maybe the end game of his decision that's a big thing to look about. That is a very big thing to be looking for on Saturday as Breland comes in, fresh off announcing a top three, another big time recruit that Georgia has a chance to host on Saturday. Now, you also know this, and speaking of folks down there in the Sunshine State, probably not being too happy. Apparently, uh, seven figure type. Uh, <laughs> 
you know, expenditures don't quite buy what they used to because for, for Florida State, that doesn't even buy them exclusivity when it comes to uh, the five-star uh, defensive back, uh, K.J. Bolden, who there's been a lot of reporting on this week, including from Steve Wilfong from 24-7 Sports, uh, that Bolden's going to be back on campus at Georgia here this weekend for the South Carolina game. Now, he's going to still be going to, you know, plenty of Florida State games, and obviously we're not ready to tell you that means that Bolden is on his way to flipping from Florida State to Georgia. We're not. But we did tell you this, the moment that Bolden committed to Florida State, we came on the air both that night and the next day and said, we didn't think this recruitment was over. Um, and I think the events since then have kind of proven us to be right about that. Ultimately, ultimately, I'm not going to make a prediction about where Bolden ends up. And obviously, the safer money would probably be that he remains a part of Florida State's class if they hold the public commitment. That has to mean something. But... Uh, it has been our expectation that Bolden would come to at least one Georgia game here this year. It's the South Carolina game that he's coming to. Sometimes recruits uh, take a visit just to see a football game, take a visit just to be a part of an environment. Maybe he wants to just hang out with his uh, good friend, the quarterback, uh, Dylan Riola. But in the case of Bolden, this situation, while sometimes recruits are simply on kind of a sightseeing venture, in the case of Bolden, I think we're led to believe it, it's perhaps a little bit more than that for uh, reasons we won't you know, fully unpack here right now. So that's another thing that makes the game there fun on Saturday. All these elite recruits, Georgia having a chance to sway them, and the presence of these kind of five-star type names uh, are the kinds of thing that are going to, I think, heighten the anticipation of what's going to go down between the hedges on Saturday. And, and I'll be honest, and then after this we'll wrap it up and talk about something different. This is the stuff that I live for almost as much as anything else. Like I, I love George winning championships, but the purpose of the championships, as far as I'm concerned, is to create the kind of big moments that a season provides. And that's really what a season is, right? It's a series of moments that you remember. And a handful of those are home games, a handful of those maybe road trips that you take, including our Dog Nation invasion of the Tennessee River coming in November. But each season really, really kind of boils down to a handful of memories that you keep with you for the rest of your life because for some of us this is really what we this is our number one pastime this is what we love we love college football and i think this saturday is going to be one of those memories kirby smart's already challenged georgia fans we believe that georgia fans are going to meet that challenge uh the presence of a bunch of elite recruits going to make the atmosphere even a little spicier a little more interesting uh we're going to talk more tomorrow about the demonstration of georgia kind of reminding everybody about what it is in terms of a comparison to the rest of college football I think it sets up to be a huge day. Awful for South Carolina. They're going to be the team on the receiving end of all of this because everything I think right now speaks to a massive, massive showcase for Georgia. Letting elite recruits know that the future is just as bright as the present and letting the rest of the college football world know that this is still the capital of this sport, and that's not planning on changing anytime soon. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented today by Meriwether and Tharp, and we are happy to have you with us no matter how you get to us. Uh, first and 15, dognation.com, Dog Nation, that's 945. All other video platforms at 10. Radio, Athens Sports Radio, 960 The Ref. Podcast, all the podcast platforms. Uh, we love our podcast, folks. Just glad to have you with us no matter how you get to us. And a huge thanks to our friends at Meriwether and Tharp who make it all possible. Your source for Georgia divorce. And for many of us, uh, divorce just kind of ends up being a little bit of a reality. Many of you, I should say, just kind of ends up being a, a little bit of a reality, right? It's like you want to try to avoid that. And if you can't avoid it, I believe you probably should. But for some people, you've tried everything you can to save the relationship that you're in. And you just sort of realize it's kind of unsalvageable. It's just severed and it's not going to be able to be repaired. And if that's the reality that you have confronted. Well, first of all, I am truly, sincerely sorry for you. But the next best thing, I believe, then is to kind of get to work on kind of having the most satisfactory outcome possible for you and your family and everything that's kind of impacted by all of this. And then setting yourself up for a more enjoyable, happier, successful next season of your life on the other side of this marriage that's come to an end. And that's really what our friends at Meriwether and Tharp are all about. They want to understand your situation. They want to hear your story. And sometimes in life, it's just sort of nice to be able to tell your story. You can tell it to them. They'll listen. They'll understand about your scenario, what's specific to you. Because while there are thousands and thousands of these experiences they've had in the past, your situation is somewhat unique and specific to you. And so they want to understand that. And plus, they want to hear from you what the best possible outcome in your mind is and then use the law to try to get that scenario put 
together for you. And that's exactly what Mary Weather and Thrott wants to do. So once you find them online, it's the Atlanta Divorce Team.com. That's the Atlanta Divorce Team.com. Mary Weather and Tharp is your source for Georgia divorce. So quick update on something we've told you about here a little bit this week. Uh, Dog Nation invasion of the Tennessee River. We kind of knew this was the case. We knew that we were going to kind of blow through this so, so quick. And we have. Uh, we'll officially announce here, and we've done this now, but we'll officially announce here the Dog Nation invasion on the Tennessee River is officially sold out. Had a few folks reach out to say, well, B.A., how about a second riverboat? <laughs> I don't quite know that we're going to be able to pull off a second riverboat here, but we can do the next best thing. We can put a waiting list together because here's what I can tell you. We're going to try to get as many people on the boat as we possibly can. We obviously are because we want as many people to have fun with us as we can. Just more people makes it more fun. We're obviously limited by like maritime law and things like that in terms of how many people you can get on a boat. So what we can do for you is give you a wait list. So if you go to dognation.com, you can get on the wait list. And obviously not everyone on the wait list is going to get on the boat. We certainly understand that. But some people on the wait list probably will. So get on that wait list. We're going to see what we can do here, see what we can figure out. And if we can get you on board, we obviously want to because we think it's going to be an incredible time. So please go dognation.com. Find the uh, tab for the uh, Dog Nation invasion of the Tennessee River. Totally sold out. We talked about Florida fans being big mad. W- you know, we're fighting wars on so many fronts right now. Gators fans are always mad about something. Tennessee fans are furious over the Dog Nation invasion of the Tennessee River. And guess what? We're just sailing right along, happy as ever. Because uh, if these folks are all this hot and bothered, that means the Dog Nation's exactly where it needs to be. So, uh, Dog Nation of the Tennessee River. Tennessee fans are enormously upset about this but it's going to be one of the most fun events we've ever done and we want you to be a part of the wait list if you couldn't get your tickets already get on the wait list we'll see if we can get a few more folks on board our wonderful wonderful boat sailing down the tennessee river for dog nation invasion it's a three-hour tailgate experience it's going to be an incredible time make sure you check that out online at dognation.com for more on that. It's Terrence Edwards coming up here in a minute, too. Prior to that, though, I do want to go around the doghouse, and it's presented today by Serve Pro, and I want to talk about Carson Beck here for a moment because I really think that, that Saturday can be and probably needs to be a pretty big day for Carson Beck, and I want to talk specifically going back a couple of weeks ago, something that, and credit to Carson Beck, who acknowledged this, that when Carson made his first start for Georgia after having not started a game of any stripe since he was in high school back in 2019, only playing sparingly, sparingly I should say, in his you know first few years here at Georgia, the moment of kind of having the spotlight on you being the starting quarterback for Georgia, um, at that particular time, uh, Carson Beck admitted a couple of weeks ago that, yeah, you know what, there's a little bit of butterflies in the stomach around something like this. This is what Beck told reporters about that, that nervousness, that anxiousness um, after the game against UT Martin a couple of weeks ago. This is what Carson Beck said then. Did you have a little bit of nerves or anything like that? In your of course. I mean, I mean, of course I had nerves. It's been a while since I've been out there and played. Um, even from last season. I mean, the last time we took the field was in January at the national championship. So it's been a lot of months and we put in a lot of work. So I was super excited to be out there though. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's an honest admission. And I think that one thing that athletes and people that really kind of do anything in kind of the public space, what I think you learn eventually is, is that just because you notice the nervousness doesn't mean you have to be impacted by it. You can notice it without being impacted by it. And I'm sure that's the journey that Carson Beck's on right now, the same way all elite athletes are when the TV cameras are on, when the crowd is in the stadium, when the band's playing, when all that's kind of going on. Of course, that's going to feel a little bit different than a scrimmage or a practice or something like that. But just because you notice the difference doesn't mean the difference has to impact your performance. And that's the kind of thing that a guy like Carson Beck is learning. But the reason why I bring up the nerves is because, once again, honest admission, Jake Fromm, when he was on our show last week, said something about his journey as a Georgia quarterback that I thought was incredibly fascinating. So for many of you, you'll remember this. But if not, let's get a reminder here. So Jake Fromm began the 2017 season. That was his true freshman year at Georgia. He began the 2017 season expected to be the number two quarterback. But in the very first game, right from almost the beginning of the game, a little bit like the Aaron Rodgers situation almost, uh, although it wasn't as serious an injury, but Jacob Easton, the Georgia starter, got hurt very, very early in the game. Jake Fromm came in. And then Eason was too hurt to play the following week. And so Jake Fromm made his first ever start. Can you imagine this? Especially for a kid that grew up loving college football. 
He made his first ever college star on the road the following week at Notre Dame Stadium. George hadn't played a non-conference game of that magnitude in decades. Uh, the first one was Jake Fromm's first ever start. I mean, can you imagine the nerves that Fromm must have been feeling? At least we can perceive that must have been incredibly anxiety-producing, incredibly you know, you know, nerve-wracking of an experience. But what Jake told us last week, and I think this is fascinating. It's the kind of thing that doesn't you know probably it's not what you'd expect to hear but it's it's so honest that it has to be true that Jake said hey my actual most nerve-wracking moment though wasn't coming into the game out of nowhere against Appalachian State and it wasn't going on the road to Notre Dame it was the game the following week against Mississippi State his first SEC start that's the one that Jake said actually probably produced more butterflies in him than almost anything else this is fascinating this is Jake from from our show last week take a listen to this for me, I felt way more nervous going into my third game playing my second start uh, at home okay. than I ever did playing Notre Dame. I don't know why, but I'm like, man, I, I got to go out. I got to play great. You know, got to start fast. That's interesting. Um, very similar type game um, because you're just expected to play great, basically play perfect. So that's Jake Fromm, who's kind of been, you know, in the arena. I guess that's what the, that's the uh, you know famous line from uh, Roosevelt. Kind of been in the arena, so he kind of knows what it feels like to be a Georgia starting quarterback. And what he would say is, it's not as intuitive as you think. You would think that big nerves when you first come into a game, huge nerves for like the biggest game that everybody remembers at Notre Dame. Then it gets easier after that. But what Jake said, all of a sudden now I'm kind of settled in. I'm the starting quarterback, and now I'm expected to play well. And all of a sudden, now I have to show up with some expectations. Everybody in 93,000-seat stadium looking here at me, expecting me to do well. And he said that actually created an additional level of nerves for me once the season started kind of going on. And so for Carson Beck, who, to his credit, was more than happy to be honest and say, hey, a little nervous about that first game against UT Martin. A little bit of butterflies about kind of being in a role I haven't been in before. What Jake Fromm would say, and perhaps he's even said this to Carson, but uh, what Jake Fromm would say is that nervousness didn't actually go away from me after a couple of starts. If anything, it got ratcheted up because now I really am the guy, and all of a sudden now I'm expected to take my performance to the next level. Now, what's interesting here is, and once again, this is where I believe if you're a Georgia fan, you hope that you can draw a parallel between Carson Beck and Jake Fromm, is in that game that Jake says he was so nervous that next start for him uh, against Mississippi State in that particular game. You know how it began. It's the flea flicker. Ball back to Jake. Jake throws a strike to a long bomb to Terry Goblin, and the route was on, and Georgia blasted Dan Mullen in Mississippi State, much to the delight of so many of us. And looking back on it, it's even more fun to think about here now. And so knowing that Jake had those butterflies, knowing that there was that little nervous anxiety about now being back home, you're getting all these pats in the back, and everybody thinks you're like a freshman phenom, and you're just ready to show the world how good you are, what did it feel like to kind of fight through those nerves and make such a big throw at the very beginning of the game? Once again, last week on the show, Jake told a great story about that. It's relevant for what Carson Beck's going to go through on Saturday. So let's hear Jake Fromm on that flea flicker moment to begin the game against Mississippi State. That was talked about all week. It was a for sure thing earlier in the week. I think we had missed one in practice, okay. and then Kirby wasn't feeling great about it. And you know, we were just trying to, you know, hey, coach, we got you. We, this, this is it. It's going to work. <laughs> and I think, you know, uh, they uh, they signed off on it, and we we got it done. So, uh, man, anytime you get an opportunity to to take a shot early in the game, uh, I think it, it it means a lot. It sends a message early. I mean, can you imagine here for a moment? I mean, Kirby Smart's kind of an old school, very serious minded coach. I don't really think of him as sort of a flea flicker type guy. Perhaps he would say he is more of that than I would give him credit for being. But I don't really think of Kirby Smart as being like, hey, let's find the trickiest play we can run. That, that just doesn't really feel like something that Kirby Smart wants to do. It seems like he wants to sort of win a street fight more than anything else. And so it would sort of seem like he's kind of against the idea of a flea flicker to begin with. At least that's kind of the thought you'd have. And so if they're running in practice and it's not going that well, you better believe, as Jake said, of course Kirby Smart's kind of souring on this idea of, I'm not sure we should do this in our SEC opener. Because remember, Georgia was only a slight favor against Mississippi State. We think of you know Georgia now as throttling everybody. There were plenty of people coming in Athens that day that thought that Georgia was a ripe for an upset. This was not a Georgia team that had won two straight national championships. This is a Georgia team that had only been eight and five a year ago, you know, you know, kind of scuffled its way through a win at Notre Dame, a team that had also not been very good 
the season before that too. So the Georgia brand wasn't quite in September of 2017 what it is in September of 2023. So, you know, this idea that you're playing with house money and you just run a flea flicker to begin the game, that's not exactly what Georgia had going for back then. And Jake says, hey, we weren't even doing this very well during practice, but uh, they convinced Kirby, we got you. We promise you we can do that. So the moral of the story is this. Jake Fromm says for that next start after Notre Dame, I was incredibly nervous. And yet he fought through those nerves. He fought through that anxiety to make a big throw at the beginning of the game that changed the tone of the rest of the game. Wouldn't that be a great thing for Carson Beck to be able to do on Saturday? You've heard me say before, if you're a regular listener, that sometime this month I'd love for Carson to have his moment like Stetson Bennett would have had against UAB in uh, 2021 where he you know, set records and had a huge stat line and kind of gave you a hint of how good he could be. But maybe this is like the next step towards doing all of that. Jake Fromm let everybody know what kind of team Georgia was and what kind of quarterback he could be with that first big throw against Mississippi State. It's a flea flicker executed to perfection. It's the kind of long bomb touchdown that caused Mississippi State to wilt just like that. And on Saturday, I think that that Carson Beck's going to have his chance to make a big throw like that too early in the game. Probably not a flea flicker, of course, but it still can be a big, long bomb type throw. And listen, the entirety of this game does not rest on Beck's shoulders. But in terms of Georgia having a chance to assert itself to the full degree that it possibly could, clearly a big game from Carson Beck is one of the ways that could be achieved. So let's watch early. Let's see if Carson Beck can have his Jake Fromm moment. Fromm, in his first SEC start at home, makes the play that everybody remembers. Can Carson Beck have something similarly memorable happen for him on Saturday? If he can, it could be a setup for a really fun season still yet to come. And that is Around the Doghouse. It's presented today by our friends at ServPro, restoration specialists. That's what they are. Talking about cleanup here, fire damage, water intrusion, all those types of things leaves a huge mess. And our friends at ServPro know how to put it all back together, clean it all up like it never even happened. That's what ServPro is all about because let's face it, when you're facing a significant situation like that, and we, as I said before, last week we had the ServPro folks back in our building here again, not on our floor, not on our uh, you know, particular you know, Dog Nation World headquarters, but certainly in the building. And when you're talking about that kind of mess, that kind of cleanup, you want experts at getting it done. That's what the restoration specialists of ServPro are. Also, each and every ServPro franchise is independently owned and operated. I like that because – this is not you know, one of those things where you can't get individual service or the people that you're working with don't have a vested you know, interest in your outcome. They want success for you as much as you want it for yourself because that's how they're building their business and their livelihood. So that's what our friends at ServPro are all about. So please find them online, ServPro.com. That's S-E-R-V, ServPro.com, bringing around the doghouse to us here today. All right, I mentioned the name of Stetson Bennett a moment ago. Um, I will tell you that obviously there was some very – We'll call it odd news that kind of uh, came out of the uh, L.A. Rams yesterday, trying to make sense of all of this. We'll address the Bennett stuff on the show before it's done. We'll tell you what we know as of right now uh, as it relates to Bennett's status of the L.A. Rams. That's before we're done. But for uh, now, something more fun than that, Georgia getting ready for South Carolina on Saturday. What we might see, some cool wrinkles from Georgia perhaps? Let's talk to a guy who has plenty of insight in all of this. It's the former Georgia wide receiver Terrence Edwards here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp here today. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. And before we get too deep into talking about Georgia football, Terrence Edwards obviously also part of this Milton coaching staff here, one of the outstanding programs in the 7A classification in Georgia. We were lucky enough to have him on Peachtree TV last week, winning a rivalry game against Roswell. Terrence, congratulations to you and your Eagles uh, coaching mates and uh, the players that you're in charge of there. Milton, a very good team right now, and I believe certainly – a potential factor to win this 7A uh, state championship. I think the 7A classification is probably as deep as it's been in quite some time here in Georgia. So congratulations on a great win last week, and it sure was fun to have you guys on television. I can't wait to be back on the set again. Uh, but just give the praise to the, to the to the guys. The kids really bought in this week and went out and proved that, you know, we will be a contender. Um in, in the seven A ball, like you said, is very deep. So the seven A is going to be very interesting this year. Well, something else that expects to be interesting is Georgia against South Carolina on Saturday. I think I speak for a lot of Georgia fans when I say, Terrence, 
we're so ready for like UT Martin and Ball State to be in the rearview mirror. Now, Georgia does have UAB again next week, so we're not quite out of the woods fully as of yet. But this is obviously a very different kind of game. Spencer Rattler's a quarterback for South Carolina people have heard of. You know, Gamecocks are certainly a step up in competition, even if Georgia's still expected to win easily. Uh, I am very excited about an SEC game for Georgia. I think this team needs it. And I think it kind of comes as an opportunity for a pretty good reminder to the rest of the country of how good Georgia still is. What do you expect to see from Georgia and South Carolina on Saturday? Uh, it's an SEC game. So you, you could go into this game knowing that it's, it's not Ball State. It, it's not UT Martin. This is a, a team in, in the past that have been a thorn in our side early in the season. So, I'm looking for the guys to come out and play their best football on Saturday. I'm going and hoping that the offensive line has have understand their assignment the last two weeks, the techniques and everything else have been sharpening up. And we can just get out of the non-conference plays. It's a conference game, so it is heightened. We have to win this game to achieve the goals of first winning the East to get our opportunity to play for the SEC championship. So it's a goal that – um, that these guys been looking for. Um, like you said earlier, I've been a, 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 a shopping guy to say we're playing for a lot, but the first two weeks have been less desirable for a lot of Georgia fans. So this opportunity at home at 3.30 to show the Georgia faithful, to show the world what we are capable of. I talked about Carson Beck for a couple of minutes before you joined us. My belief that I think that Saturday can be a big day for him. I think it'd be great for him to really introduce himself to the rest of the country with how he plays. But it's also one of those things of, you know, for a guy who said, hey, first start a couple of weeks ago, a little bit of nervousness. Jake Fromm said for my first SEC start, I had even more nervousness that you would – perhaps believe that could be true for Beck again, fighting through that, having some big throws early, kind of setting the tone for this Georgia offense. I think it's a pretty big spotlight around Carson Beck, but I also think it's a moment that Beck could be ready for. Uh, Terrence, what are your expectations for him? I expect him to go in and play well. Uh, I expect him that he will be nervous, just like Jake Fromm said, but uh, it's twofold. Jake had an opportunity to hit a wide open Terry Gotten yeah. got one. So that's a, a nice, easy throw to make. Uh, so I just suspect that, you know, Coach Bobo get him some easy throws. And if that's a deep ball, but if my guy's wide open, that's, that's still a relative easy throw. Uh, Coach Bobo also said in passes, he loves getting the, the playmakers the ball quickly. So it could be some boots, it could be some screens, it just could, it could be some of the easy passes to get brought out in the flats with some play action just to get the nerves out. And once he really get hit or make a big-time throw, um, the nerves will subside pretty quickly. He's just going back to playing football, something he's been doing his whole life. But I think it, it will be kind of nervous to face your first SEC opponent knowing that this team is, is not UAB, it's not Ball State, it's not UT Martin. This is a legitimate SEC opponent. Even if we are better, there's still an SEC opponent in his first SEC game. So along those lines, I was going to ask you about this because it's the cliche that we hear a lot of, hey, you may be nervous before the game, but once you get hit for the first time or maybe perhaps as a wide receiver, once you run a route for the first time, then after that you sort of settle in and now you're just playing football. So when Georgia does have the moment like Terry Godwin running wide open in that game against Mississippi State, you have the big play early. How much does that allow the entire team then just sort of settle down right after that? It does. I mean, just going out and exciting the crowd exciting the fan base, exciting the team like with that big play. And everyone can relax a little bit more. I think even if you're a star and veteran of the team, you still go out there with the sense of, man, we scored on the first place now. Defense, let's go. So it, it kind of brings everybody's anxiety level down a little bit. Um, so I just hope we go out there. I hope we take the ball. I hope we put the offense out there first. And I would love to see just – I don't want to see a big play. I don't, I don't, I don't personally don't want to see a Terry guy. I want to see this offense right here just move the ball okay. down the field and kind of break the defense's wheel on that first drive. Then the, the defense get the ball back. That's the type of drive that I would like to see from the offense. Uh, a guy that you've touted on our show before is Dylan Bell, and last week we saw a very interesting wrinkle with Bell. Got a chance to be used as a running back, and I think a lot of us sort of assume that if they ever needed a running back, Bell looks like he could be one because he's kind of a beefy wide receiver. You'd discussed that yourself before i think you've made the comparison between him and like say a kiaris jackson somebody like that who also had a little bit of a uh, beefiness to him from a wide receiver spot well last week we saw bell get some carries 
Terrence, is that something you'd like to see him do more of? Do you think that Bell could potentially have value for Georgia, especially in a situation where you got some injuries and you know you maybe don't have the full complement of running backs here right now? Do you foresee a, a sense in which Georgia may have greater value from Bell, keeping him at the running back spot? I think so as of right now. We don't have that guy like Kenny McIntosh who could put his foot in the ground and make a guy miss. If you just look at the run that Kenny – that Bell had last week where he made a guy miss, uh, that's something we don't have. We have the big bruisers right now that doesn't have the wiggle to make a guy miss. Yes, they can run over you and, and wear you down, but in the open field we need a guy that can make you miss and take it a touchdown like Dylan Bell had. So I believe he brings a matchup problem uh, because of his receiving skill and his route running ability if he stays there and get more opportunity at running back. Uh, or as a defensive, do you bring in a, diff, a different sub package to match his ability? So there's a lot of wrinkles that we can do, but I would love to see him get 10 to 15 touches. If, that, if, if that's 10 runs and, and five throws, uh, because he bring a different dimension to the offense that we don't have right now. And, of course, you and me, as students of Georgia football history, we know that a – player converted to a running back ahead of a game against South Carolina that's worked out pretty well in Georgia's past has it not Terrence oh most definitely I, I mean there was a guy who scored five total touchdowns in his <laughs> first game as, as a running back and about 170 yards uh, some guy that you know switched from DB to running back and just had a great day um, I don't know him very well but uh, <laughs> if we could get that performance from someone I, I would love to to see it. Uh, of course, we're talking about Terrence's brother, Robert Edwards, there on that, which is a fun thing to think about. And I guess the last thing for me on this is, you know, my kind of like as obsessive compulsive brain, if he is going to get more carries, we got to get him out of 86, Terrence. I, I, can't, I, I can't have you back there taking carries wearing number 86. There, there is something about that that just sort of blinds me when I see 86 taking the carries like that. I feel like you got to give him a 30 something number, don't you? Yeah, yes. You know, we, we look at the Falcons. Uh, Receiver turn running. Yeah, back. Cordell Patterson. That's Play a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. And you know, and he he, he kept eight one, but I, I I just don't know. Uh, Dylan is my guy, and him back there wearing number eighty six right now doesn't look right, doesn't feel right. Uh, but if he continues to put up the numbers that he he has last week versus an SEC opponent, I guess we can stick with eighty six. But it just doesn't. It doesn't look right back there running the ball and being the player that he is. We got to get him in, in a get him some different swag that, as these kids say today. And he don't have the drip right now. Number eighty six playing that position. I, I like it, Terrence. That's a good thought. Uh, one more player I wanted to mention here with you for a moment. That's Makai Muse. I think you and I talked about Muse a little bit last week. But, you know, he goes out and does big things again on Saturday. You know, Terrence, this is a real thing right now. I mean, he's a huge weapon. And for Georgia offense, it's still trying to kind of figure out its way here right now. Shorter fields, perhaps adding a score on special teams to kind of keep that point total where you want it to be. All of that, I believe, takes on an extra value for Georgia here right now. How important do you think Muse has been? And how important do you think he'll continue to be for Georgia here this season? Well... You know, I'm not going to pat myself on the back, yeah. but I did say before the season started, but we was on, I said my Kai Muse will have a big impact on this team before the season even started. I think it was the week before the season started, and I brought that up. Like, my Kai Muse is going to have a big impact, man. He's just not a G-Day superstar because I've seen him do this week in and week out at practice, the opportunities that I got to. Go see practice, and he he has practiced against the number one defense the last few years, and he's been able to just showcase his talent. So this is this is not a blip; this is a trend, and he's going to be a guy that make big plays for us, and he, and he has so far in the first two weeks. Absolutely, and there's something about this that Terrence is kind of old school from the standpoint that you know the punt return game hasn't been a huge deal for Georgia in the last few years, but really. Teams don't return punts for long gains at all, really anymore. I mean, I guess they're scoring so much other ways that teams aren't punting, you know, very much. But like the whole kick return game now is just so much less than it once was. Not just to Georgia, but kind of across the board. When you look at the like the leaders and punt return touchdowns for a season, I mean, you know, you go back ten years ago, uh, the numbers for like most punt returns much higher than they are now in a typical year. So there's an element of like Muse and the special teams. 
that's a little bit of like a throwback to kind of an old school time in, in college football back when the kick game just meant so much more than it seems to me now. Well, Jeff, I think the, the punt teams now have been so uh, – it's definitely because of the, the tight splits that we used to have when I played, but now they have the spread splits where you're getting everyone out with the spread splits. You're able now to get more agile, deep defenders running down and having a big offensive line that's the pass protectors, but now you have more coverage with guys that are used to be tackling in space. Uh, the rugby style kicking now allows the cover scene to get down where there's not a lot of returns uh, been had. So you don't see a lot of returns. But all all we need is Makai to average about 10 yards a carry um, on the punt. So that's a first down, essentially. And field position, I mean, you don't have to take them. As long as we're getting the field position, he's catching the football when he, when he needs to catch him. He's not bobbling them, so he's making great decisions back there. And I, I foresee him to stay. I think Ladd has been there um, the last few years. I don't need Ladd back there with his back injury. Uh, Makai has done a great job, and uh, he continues on this role. He's going to be up for some special teams award. But he's been a great impact so far uh, for us, and I, as I predicted that he would be. No, absolutely right. You sure did, Terrence. Great stuff. Thank you for being here as a part of uh, our program here today. And for folks who want to get more of the insight you have there on social media, obviously working with great wide receivers and pass catchers, how can they connect with the Terrence Edwards Wide Receiver Academy? Uh, you can find me on all social media platforms at Terrence Edwards Wide Receiver Academy. Terrence, always a great pleasure to talk to you. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Love having Terrence on the show. Love his thoughts there about Makai Muse. And Muse is two things at once. He is, as we said, a really important player for Georgia right now. When I start thinking about what I need to see from Georgia on Saturday, <laughs> Makai Muse is a part of my game plan right now. You know, creating a short field for this Georgia offense. If we talk about getting off to a faster start as a way of just settling Georgia into the game, Muse helps with that. He can give you a short field on a kick return, and you can do something with that. But in addition to being an important part of the story overall for Georgia, he's also a great story in his own right. And I do like stuff like this. I really do. And I love the fact that Georgia, in the midst of five-star this and future first-round pick that, also has the guy who came out of nowhere. And there's always a couple of guys who came out of nowhere, seemingly on every one of these really good Georgia teams. And I'm just glad that football leaves room for that. I mean – Clearly, we gravitate towards a lot of the blue chip prospects because they're interesting to talk about. We talked about elite recruits off the top of the show today. But I also like the fact that, you know, football is a sport where you don't have to start from the same place the elite recruit did, but y'all can finish the same spot. Love that about this game, man. It's really, really a fun thing. And I can't wait to see what Muse does next against South Carolina on Saturday. Something else I can't wait for, that's the chance to be back on the Caribbean again very soon. I, I need – I can only go so long without getting a little bit of beach in my life, a little bit of uh, – Caribbean Sea in my life, being on a Royal Caribbean cruise vacation. And the good news is I got a chance to experience this with so many of you coming up in just a uh, brief amount of time. Really, it'll be here before you know it. I'm talking about April of 2024 for the Dog Nation cruise that comes up on board Allure of the Seas. This is the first ever opportunity for us because our Dog Nation cruise this year is going to be bigger and better than it's ever been before because we're going to be on an Oasis-class ship. Now, if you don't cruise very much or you hadn't cruised before at all, let me explain to you why this is different. Is because what the Oasis-class ships did when they were introduced by Royal Caribbean is they kind of set a new standard in terms of things to do on board the ship. In addition to the cool stuff that Royal Caribbean had been doing for a while, the Oasis-class ships introduced like the aqua theater on the back of the ship. That means you have another entertainment experience, the high-diving shows and the things like that, which is really unlike anything else that exists at sea, the Broadway-style shows, the additional neighborhoods. You know, you've had the Royal Promenade, but on the Oasis class ship, you also have, like, the Boardwalk neighborhood. That's like a carousel and great restaurants and sort of feels like you're on Coney Island. Or you have the Central Park neighborhood, which is really like walking through a, 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 a park, like, right in the middle of a town somewhere. You have these, like, cool bars and restaurants you're walking through. You have live foliage, flora and fauna, like real actual growing plants and you're walking through all of that, it's so peaceful and so tranquil, it's hard to imagine while you're walking through there that you're actually at sea, but you are. And so that's why this year's Dog Nation crew is going to be bigger and better than it's ever been before because we're going to be on board an Oasis-class ship like Allure of the Sea. So 
please check out Jessica Slater, great travel agent, uh, especially selected for us by Royal Caribbean. You can give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. Or email her, jslater, dreamvacations.com. And you can also check out royaldogs.com. That's the website for our Dog Nation crews to find out more about what we're going to be doing here this upcoming April. All right, let's talk about a couple things here for a moment. So there is pretty clearly a narrative forming around the SEC. And to be frank, I'm not quite so sure that it's wrong. Um, Alabama has lost to Texas. For now, Texas does not count as an SEC team. LSU has lost to Florida State. South Carolina, who Georgia will see on Saturday, it has lost to North Carolina. And you're looking at a scenario in which the SEC is kind of collecting more losses. Florida's lost to Utah as part of this, even though Florida's not very good, not really carrying the flag for the SEC, but nonetheless, it counts against the SEC's record. You're looking at a scenario right now in which the SEC, by perception, is weaker than it's been in a good number of years. And I don't think you can argue against that too much. It just seems like that's probably true. But the question is, does that end up being a problem for Georgia? Is Georgia's resume for playoff and seeding within the playoff and things like that, is that going to be hurt by the current perception of the SEC? I'm of the belief that no, it will not. And that's why I think that Saturday is important. What Georgia is playing to do is prove that it kind of transcends the SEC right now, the same way that Clemson at one point in time would have transcended a very weak ACC. Uh, It's a lot more difficult to transcend the SEC just given the overall depth of the league. But Georgia... Uh, based on the overall program strength that it has right now, can do that. In other words, here is what the narrative, I think, should be, and we'll see this possibly form over the course of the next few weeks. The narrative that's going to form is is that it's not about, oh, it's a weaker SEC. It's about everybody is weaker in comparison to Georgia. Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State of the Big Ten, uh, the rest of the SEC for sure, the Texases, the USC's, perhaps the Florida States, that nobody plays at the same level that Georgia does. That is, for the most part, what last season was all about. And I still don't know that people properly appreciated not just the fact that Georgia won another national championship, but how easy it made it look. You know, you can, and there's always going to be some sort of naysayer that loves kind of, oh, well, Georgia kept it close against Missouri, and ah, Georgia could have lost Ohio State. The fact of the matter is, over the course of a 15-game season, Georgia had 13 games that were incredibly easy, and a couple of them where they, for the most part, kind of had to go down to the wire. Y'all, that is a historic level of dominance in terms of a march towards national championship. And sure, they could have lost, uh, but you know we don't judge a team by whether or not it could have lost. LSU, which is kind of you know usually considered one of the best single-season teams of all time, it could have lost to Auburn uh, back in 2019. Auburn was a very good team either that particular year. The point is, is that Georgia won a national championship last year as easy as one will ever win a national championship. I think that this year it's at least possible it could do the same thing again. That's why I want to see what the result looks like against South Carolina. If Georgia beats South Carolina as bad this year as it has the last couple of years, then I think we could be on our way to seeing Georgia establish itself as a team that's not kind of dragged down by a weaker SEC. The resume isn't punished by that because what Georgia demonstrates is that it not only transcends the SEC in the somewhat watered-down league that it perhaps is this year, but it also just sort of transcends the rest of the sport there as well. But let's game this out for a moment. Let's say that Georgia takes a loss because even with Georgia's dominant as it is, statistically speaking, a loss is still – I don't want to say probable, but it's likely, right? I mean, a, a loss is you know certainly you know a, a a possibility if nothing else. So, what if Georgia were to be twelve and one? What if Georgia? Let's, let's give you both versions of the twelve and one. If they're twelve and one SEC champion, even in a weak SEC, I can't imagine a scenario in which they were excluded from the college football playoff. I can't imagine that. But what if their twelve and zero turns into a twelve and one after an SEC championship? meaning that Georgia were to lose the SEC championship because while I wouldn't expect the SEC West winner to be better than Georgia, anything can happen on a single game basis. What happens then? Too early to get too worried about this now, but let me tell you what my argument will be if that occurs. Obviously, Georgia made the playoff and won the national championship in 2021 after losing in the SEC championship. If that scenario were to happen again in terms of Georgia losing in December, some people would say, oh, well, the SEC is not strong enough right now for a – league to get two teams in or for a league like that to get a non-conference champion in but I'm going to tell you right now that Georgia on the basis of having won the last two national championships unless it does something to truly disqualify itself from competition 
Georgia deserves the chance to defend its belt in the college football playoff. It does. It deserves a chance to defend its title in the college football playoff. Um, you cannot exclude Georgia from a national championship in a boardroom. You have to give them a right to play that out on the field. That's what I believe anyway. And ultimately, I believe that Georgia, by its own level of play, may make this a moot discussion, I believe. But, uh, but just keep in mind that if Georgia, by tripping up or by whatever reason, kind of brings this into discussion, there are a lot of people who are going to want to use the relative weakness of the SEC against Georgia if this becomes a resume comparison game. So keep your eye on that. Speaking of SEC teams that have already lost, LSU, they get a chance to show what they're all about going on the road on Saturday to Mississippi State. Now, this is a very different version of Mississippi State than it has been. Uh, right now, Will Rogers, you know, he's throwing the ball like all season long, almost less than he would throw it in like one game when he was obviously working for the uh, Mike Leach offense last couple of years. LSU on Saturday is about a what, nine, nine and a half point favorite. They're on the road. I think this is an important game for LSU. There's been some chatter coming out of Baton Rouge. There's like some infighting going on there that not everybody's on the same page. It seems like this is a little bit of a team. I mean, at least if you believe the rumor mill stuff, there's a little bit of a culture issue down there right now. And I am still of the belief that LSU can be an elite football team. I, I, I do believe that. I think Florida State beating LSU probably says more about how good Florida State is than it potentially says about how bad LSU might be, I think anyway. But if what I'm saying is true, LSU's got to go on the road on Saturday and show that against a first-time head coach playing in his first ever SEC game that you know kind of just barely beat Arizona a week ago. This needs to be a big day for LSU on Saturday. So in what is a pretty soft slate for college football in week three, there's some kind of put-up or shut-up type moments. We kind of discussed Tennessee in that vein yesterday. LSU is one of those teams for Saturday against Mississippi State. Now, there have been some very memorable LSU-Mississippi State games over the years, and good LSU teams have not always handled Mississippi State well. Uh, so this is not an automatic spot for LSU by a long shot, but it is a spot in which LSU, I think, needs to show what they're all about. We'll see if they're capable of doing that. And then I'll just quickly mention this. And what is otherwise, you know, as I said before, kind of a week, uh, a week, W-E-A-K, week, W-E-E-K, week, uh, a week, week three slate, if you get my drift there on that. Um, interesting to see Missouri with Kansas State coming to call there on Saturday. You know, Missouri's going to settle on Brady Cook as its starting quarterback. And, you know, I think a lot of folks sort of expected like a Sam Horn who went to Collins Hill, throwing the ball to Travis Hunter a couple of years ago, or a Jake Garcia who had transferred in from Miami. I think a lot of folks thought one of those guys might emerge as a starting quarterback. But right now it seems like Cook's going to be the guy there for Missouri. And I don't think this Missouri team is very good. They just barely beat Middle Tennessee State a week ago. So, if Missouri is going to have any chance to start any SEC play with momentum, uh, what they do against Kansas State on Saturday could be a little bit interesting. So we'll watch that a little bit as one of the handful of games around the uh, SEC this week uh, of note. Also, you get Arkansas hosting BYU. Uh, I think these are all very important games for Sam Pittman. I like Pittman a lot. He needs to find wins where he can get them. And this game against BYU on Saturday is an example of that. But keep in mind, Arkansas is also playing with that its terrific running back, Rocket Sanders, on Saturday, too. So a little bit of an issue there for the Hogs. We'll see how that plays. That will make that cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. Now, uh, before we wrap up here today, many Georgia fans got some strange news yesterday. It's been difficult to know exactly how to process this. Ian Rappaport's a terrific reporter that covers the NFL for NFL.com, NFL Network. Let me show you what he put out on yesterday that the Rams have placed rookie quarterback Stetson Bennett on the reserve NFI list. NFI stands for non-football injury, taking him off the, uh, the active roster. The quote that Rappaport shares from Sean McVay is, out of respect for him in the situation, I'm going to leave all those specifics in particular in-house. I went to try to watch the full press conference from McVay from the Rams it seems like they may have edited out the first beginning portion of this or at least they just started the recording late or something like that some of the other stuff that he said it was not you know easily found but there are quotes coming out of this from the uh, Rams media that this is not related to a shoulder injury that that Bennett was dealing with during the preseason not related to that this is as the list would suggest a non-football injury now we are obviously not going to speculate on anything as it relates to this here right now in terms of what, what this might be, but we are comfortable saying this, that if it's a non-football injury that's keeping him away from the football field right now, 
that's at least something that's worthy of our prayers for Bennett, right? Can we understand that? That we may not want to speculate openly about what Bennett might be going through that's taking him away from football, but if something away from the field is taking him off the active roster, then certainly Bennett's worthy of our prayers here right now. So we really sincerely, truly uh, will be praying for Stetson on this, that whatever's going on here that's taking him away from football that he has a satisfactory resolution to that. Uh, Stetson, I hope, knows how beloved he is by so many Georgia fans, how thankful so many of us are for uh, the great happy memories that he brought two straight national championship teams to UGA. And we won't presume to know what's going on here right now, but this was a little bit of an odd announcement yesterday, uh, the kind of thing that kind of promotes some concern, of course. And so we'll watch it and we'll see where this goes. And if there's new information, we'll obviously give it to you. But for a lot of folks who were excited about the chance to be a, to see Stetson be a backup to, to, to Matthew Stafford, to work with a quarterback-friendly coach like Sean McVay, to really be a part of a Rams organization that can be a pretty good spot for a quarterback, for now it seems like that's kind of put on pause. So we will see what comes next in all of this, and uh, we'll truly, sincerely, uh, heartfelt be sending out prayers to Stetson for whatever it is that's causing him to be away from that Rams organization here right now. So more details when they become available. And on a much happier note, uh, let's get ready to wrap things up today with a golden shoe. We started the program today by laughing at those lousy, stinking Gators of Florida because of their anger over a recruiting loss that's not necessarily a recruiting loss to Georgia, but it's a recruiting loss that benefits Georgia right now because the guy that's leaving Gainesville, Makai Boro, is actually visiting Georgia this weekend, so that's at least fun to consider. And never a bad time to make fun of the lousy sticking Gators. With that in mind, Bill Sanders writes in to say, it's always a great day to be a Gator hater. And you see a kid in the spelling bee saying, your word is Gators. And Bill says, Gators, G-A-R-B-A-G-E, Gators, yeah. Garbage is more like it, Bill. You're absolutely right about that. Very, very funny stuff. Very deserving of a golden shoe here today. And speaking of the lousy stinking Gators, this week, not the only loss they'll take. How about 44 days from right now at the hands of George and the cocktail party once again? Fun to think about that. That's our Gator Hater Countdown. We'll see you tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily presented by Merriweather and Tharp. And on video, time now for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown. R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. R.S. Andrews shows up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. You can trust R.S. Andrews on all of that. I'm glad to be back taking your comments again. Always having fun doing all of that. Uh, we'll keep them going here right now. In fact, let me uh, start on dognation.com because I'm right here, and then we'll kind of roll through everything else. Keith Dog says, good morning, you fabulous winning on top dog people. Keith, I love that. That's good stuff. Georgiana Olive having some fun with our Dog Nation invasion. The Dog Nation comment section, Georgiana, that's really funny. Um, Randy Hall says the Gators may become a minor league team for the dogs. Yeah, sort of like how the Braves have seemingly like taken every player off the Oakland Athletics and kind of made them into something in Atlanta. Uh, maybe Florida could, could uh, become Georgia's version of that. B Max says Sunbelt Billy may not be there uh, by the time he goes to Florida. Uh, could be the case. I mean, I, we told you yesterday, Dan Mullen kind of took a little bit of an interesting shot. I don't want to say shot. That may be the wrong word. But he definitely did not do Billy Napier any favors this week when he was on one of those ESPN shows, kind of talking about the need for uh, Florida to win some games against a rival, for Napier himself to kind of do that. I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, back over here on YouTube. Uh, Thomas Tyson wants to see the uh, offensive line play better for Georgia on Saturday. I think that's an important thing to mention. I do. Um, I, I believe and have believed this offensive line was going to be one of Georgia's top strengths through two games. That hasn't necessarily been the case, so you'd like to see some improvement there. I think you're right about that. Let's see what else. Um, Cassie Turner says the uh, standard that you're holding uh, players to is astounding. They're not going to be able to play perfectly every time. That's exactly right. Uh, you know, you're going to have – like perfection is not the standard. Excellence is the standard. And excellence means, you know, making the most out of as many opportunities as you possibly can. But obviously, if the standard is perfection, everyone's going to fall short. Cass Cassie's obviously right about that. Um, 
Uh, Frank Patterson says the main reason the flea flicker worked was because the ball was handed to Chubb. Entire front and secondary had to immediately run up to respect it, leaving the deep ball open. That's really funny. Uh, nobody loves Georgia running backs more than Frank Patterson does, for sure. Um, Jeremy Arvin says that Brock Bowers is not a below-average blocker. He's absolutely not. I don't know if that's been a comment section a topic today or not, but he's absolutely not a below-average blocker. He may not be, you know, a bully like Darnell Washington is. I mean, Darnell Washington's, you know, cruel in terms of how he would dismantle people. But Bowers is more, you know, Bowers is more than adequate as a blocker, I believe. Foster Moss wondering if we should like rent an entire like charter entire Royal Caribbean cruise ship and sort of send that thing down the Tennessee River. Uh, I wouldn't mind doing that. I wouldn't mind doing that. Uh, yeah, Cassie, I know you weren't talking about me. I know you weren't talking about me. Hey, Brandon, how concerned are you about the Tennessee Spanish Armada or Coast Guard or, or whatever on this on this uh, cruise thing? Let me tell you something. I'm not worried about those Tennessee people. Uh, first of all, Tennessee's not Tennessee fans aren't organized enough to do anything like that to uh, stop us. You saw the you know haphazard mess they were throwing mustard bottles and things like that. Now they're going to be mad and crying on the shore. Of course they're going to be. But if the forecast calls for rain, they won't even show up. So. Um, we, we kind of learned that a year ago that, uh, you know, Tennessee, look in life, there are workhorses and there are show ponies and Tennessee fans are show ponies. They are front runners. And as long as things are good, boy, they are all feeling good. But the moment any kind of adversity strikes, uh, they're not capable of doing anything. I don't know who said that about Brock Bowers, but that's funny. Um, I mean, look. I, I, I'm not even going to scroll back up here to find out who criticized Bowers, but uh, I mean Brock Bowers is one of the three or four greatest players in the history of the Georgia program. Um, Foster Moss says the Mississippi State game is the one in which Roquan Smith became him. It is, however, and I'm not going to try to say I'm the smartest person in the world. When I saw him against Notre Dame, which statistically speaking was not as big a performance, I realized how special he could be because I remember a couple of moments in that game in which Roquan from the middle of the field was levitating towards the sideline. I mean, it was such a, whoosh, I mean, he was just, I mean, he was like literally like just, I mean, just it was a magic trick how fast he was moving. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. He kind of came into his own that Mississippi State game. But I just remember thinking during the Notre Dame game of, I cannot believe how quick Roquan Smith goes from the middle of the field to the sideline. It's amazing. Um, uh, Spencer Clark says I love Bowers but I think his blocking could be better I guess so I mean look here's the thing though and I understand where you're coming from Spencer and you're a great commenter so I'm not going to criticize I mean you're, you're a good commenter but here's the thing is like in Madden you can and like my son likes to play like uh, MLB the show so you can turn the knobs up and you can be like 99 across the board right um in football, though, nobody's 99s across the board, right? No one's 99s across the board. So we would certainly understand that, okay, well, the thing that makes you an amazing pass catcher is going to probably cost you a little something when it comes to your overall blocking ability. And the thing that I judge Bowers on is, is he a willing blocker? In other words, he could become a better blocker, but getting – beefier and playing hand in the dirt a little bit more and things like that well, all of a sudden now he's not quite as good of a pass catcher so give me in the case of Brock Bowers an elite all-time great pass catcher who is a willing blocker as opposed to an elite all-time great blocker who would certainly be willing to pass catch the ball if they would throw it to him and that's just the reality of football there is no free lunch that being great at something almost certainly means you're going to be less great at something else because there are complementary skills and they're kind of contradictory skills. And blocking and catching are a little bit of a contradictory skill. Um, and so, you know, when uh, when Georgia talks about, you know, Kirby in particular, wide receivers who can block, I think what Kirby's really asking them to be is just willing to block. There are some wide receivers who are great blockers. You know, you go back to the Heinz Ward era, I don't think anyone's been better. J.J. Holloman was a really good blocking wide receiver for Georgia but ultimately what you want is a willing blocker and go back and watch Lad McConkey's rushing touchdown to begin the season against Oregon a year ago Brock Bowers is putting a dude in the stands on that I mean he really is I mean he's putting a dude into the section 125 or whatever 
So I, when I see Bowers, see what I believe is a very willing blocker. Is he as good a blocker as he is a pass catcher? Probably not. But I would not trade that complementary skill set for anything because the pass catching is just far more valuable. Jay Scheib says uh, Kyle Pitts refused to block in college. Well, there you go. That just kind of goes to show you how poorly coached he would have been down in Florida. Um, uh, a Ducati 1098 says Holloman was nasty for sure. Yeah, one of my favorite plays involving J.J. was the DeAndre Swift touchdown in the Kentucky game in 2018. Bit, and honestly – there's less of this probably in the Georgia program than there used to be, and there's probably a reason why Georgia doesn't have quite as many long runs. Once again, it goes back to kind of a complimentary thing. Georgia's receivers are catching the ball now more than they did in the past. They're blocking probably less, and all of a sudden now you see fewer explosive runs, but probably more explosive receptions. It's kind of interesting how, once again, some skill sets are somewhat complementary and some are somewhat contradictory. So back then, Georgia wasn't throwing the ball uh, as successfully as it does now, but guys like DeAndre Swift are getting 50- and 60-yard runs and you go back and watch that run against Kentucky, which was a big game for Georgia that day. At Kentucky in 2018, big game. Won the SEC East, and the touchdown that put the game on ice was sprung deep down the field by a pow, big block by a Holloman. Darian Davis says, what am I looking for most of this Saturday? A 100-yard rusher, a 100-yard receiver? Um I think I'm going to put more of this on the passing game for Saturday. I, I I think that Georgia's running game is eventually going to be fine. It's probably not going to be spectacular. It's not going to be you know Chubb and Michelle, but it's probably going to be fine. Um, I think you need to get Carson Beck going on Saturday. I, I do. I think you really need to get him going because the more that that passing game requires opposing defenses respect, the easier it's going to be to get the running game going at that point. But eventually, health is going to make Georgia better running the football. Um, I just think that's the case. But the offensive passing game needs a little bit of time to gel, needs a little bit of a time to develop. That's what I think Saturday's probably going to be about. Um, Stick D says, I'm looking for Delp to show on the field his work on blocking on Saturday. Yeah, I think that uh, Oscar Delp, you know, you know the South Carolina game means a lot to him. Could be a fun day for him there too. Uh, Cassie Turner says that Carson needs to start slinging the ball downfield. Yeah, Cassie, I agree with you. Want to see some vertical shots from him, and I'd love to see him connect on some of those, as we've talked about today, early in the game if possible. I think that would be a a really valuable thing. All right, let me go to Facebook here for a moment, and then we'll try to do more comments tomorrow, but I'm going to have to wrap up a little early today or earlier than I did yesterday. Boy, it's fun to be doing this again, y'all. Thanks for your patience while we weren't live, but uh, fun to be doing this. Um, we had a little bit of an issue last night and, uh, we came, I came rushing up here. We were here, we were here last night, you know, 10 o'clock, something like that, nine thirty, ten o'clock, uh, just trying to make sure that this was all working right because I wanted to be live today for sure. Uh, William Camacho says, congratulations to the Bravos for clinching the East for a sixth straight season. Yeah. We mentioned this a little earlier, thrilled about that. Just absolutely thrilled. Uh, Really excited about this postseason run. You can't guarantee anything, but Braves going to have, I, I think, the best record in the National League. They have a very good shot. At their, they currently have and have a very good shot of finishing with the best record in all of baseball. Going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> Matt Rukavina. I can't read that. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Ryan, uh, who he calls himself Historian Walker, and Ryan is a history uh, major when it comes to sports. I uh, always appreciate his perspective on sports. He says, you're hearing it here first. Makai Muse is now called Danger Mouse, like the old school cartoon. He says, we had Monty Mouse in Heinz Ward. Now we got Danger Mouse in Muse. He's definitely a wild card, uh, but the kid I've uh, been harping on has uh, been Bell. He says, since he's got on campus, he's been uh, he's been showing the potential to be a star for the dogs, and the other uh, breakout pass catcher going to be C.J. Smith. Yeah, Ryan, I've been impressed with C.J. Smith, too. I have been. I'd love to see more from Dylan Bell. And speaking of history, what you know, Terrence Edwards and I were joking about a little earlier, if you're not fully acquainted with this, is his brother Robert was also at one point in time. Now, Robert was a defensive back, but prior to the game against South Carolina in 1995, he made his running back debut and set a program record with five touchdowns there that day. So uh, 
I'm certainly not suggesting that's what uh, Bell's going to do on Saturday, but it'd be fun to think about him being more involved in the offense. And I like the idea of Makai Muse as kind of a danger mouse type thing. I kind of like that. Um, danger mouse. Was he also in Narles Barkley too? Was that the was that the guy that was uh, with um, part of Narles Barkley? Uh, let's see what else. Uh, David Hogue says, anybody tired of winning yet? Braves fans, Dogs fans, tired of winning yet? No, I don't think so. David, you are absolutely right about that. Let's see what else. Uh, Craig Jones says um, that Bowers needs to begin his rise here in this game. No really Heisman-type buzz for him as of yet. Yeah, I mean, obviously the bigger games are going to put more of a spotlight on Georgia but you are right, just given the fact that it would be kind of a non-traditional, unorthodox Heisman campaign for Bowers to begin with, uh, that it has to be a very consistent, resounding message week after week after week um, if he's going to if he's going to show up in a show like uh, I should say in, in, a, in a conversation like that. It would have to be just a sort of a resounding conversation, which means you got to have that moment against South Carolina. A year ago, he did. And you have to kind of keep that going the rest of the way. The one thing I did kind of hypothesize about during the offseason was is that last year at times, Georgia was kind of content not to use Bowers very much. And then when they got to the national championship, there was nothing left to save it for. So they just turned him loose, and he darn near had 200 yards receiving. Based on a couple of things that Kirby said during the offseason, I kind of wondered, well, you know, maybe this year, knowing this is probably their last year to use Bowers, knowing how special he could possibly be, maybe they do feature him more just on a regular basis because, you know, perhaps they just sort of realize there's nothing to save it for now. You might as well go out and do it. I don't know. We'll see on Saturday if they do showcase him a little bit more because at times last year they were content not to do it. Remember, Bowers did not have a huge game against Oregon a year ago either. They just didn't showcase him very much. Drew Miller says, I wish the Heisman was more diverse for other positions and not so political uh, or rather a media media favorite spotlight. Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of gotten opened up a little bit here in that, you know, you saw a defensive player become a finalist a year ago, even even if it was the wrong defensive player, it was still a defensive player. You know, wide receiver won it a couple of years ago. So I think think that the idea that it's simply the best quarterback every single year, um, I think that's probably changed a little bit. But I'm like you, though. The, the award would be more interesting if it was kind of opened up to like truly the best player, not always a quarterback, and perhaps not even always kind of like the best player in the best team, because that's the other thing the Heisman kind of historically has been. Hey, there's a spot reserved for best player on the best team. You know, let's say like Todd Gurley in 2014, for instance. Georgia was not a national championship level team in 2014, but Gurley prior to the you know, highway robbery of the NCAA suspension and then the uh, injury that happened after that. You make a very good case that Gurley was truly one of the best players in the country, probably should have gotten more Heisman consideration, but that kind of player back then wasn't really kind of getting that kind of consideration, probably still don't now. You know, the 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 players that have won the Heisman on less than great teams, RG3, Lamar Jackson, certainly Barry Sanders going back a long time. You know, the award would be interesting if, Hey, sometimes it is the quarterback of the national champion, but sometimes it's the best linebacker from so-and-so or the guy that's just doing amazing things, playing on a team that doesn't have much help, and he's they're only 8-4, and 7-5, and five, but that's a player that truly deserves the award. You know, kind of opening it up to all kinds of players like that, I do think would be more valuable. Um, let's see what else. Kind of one more trip around the comment section, so we're going to get ready to go for today. Uh, JP says, I grew up and played with the Edwards brothers down here in uh, uh, middle Georgia down there, and uh, uh, Takeo Spikes there as well. So there you go, yeah. Uh, nice to know, of course, the Edwards brothers, uh, very proud of that Washington County heritage down there. Uh, great, great history of high school football and a great pipeline to Georgia throughout the years there too. You know, Randy McMichael coming to Peach County, uh, Kiers Jackson, you know, there's just so many of those great like, like middle Georgia-type guys. Um a DT says, how about Darnell Washington pancaking NFL defensive player of the year, Nick Bose in his first NFL game. I saw that. I, I thought that was amazing. I mean, I think the same thing sometimes about Derek Henry too, because I was watching red zone on Sunday and like, for whatever reason, and I know our buddy, uh, Frankie Patterson is going to hate this. Um, I've always liked Derek Henry. 
there's something about Henry that I just find to be fascinating. The fact that, you know, he takes the handoff. An NFL player is charging after him has, as hard as he possibly can. And with one hand, Derrick Henry can just shove the guy to the ground. Like the amount of strength that requires. Like the NFL tacklers are the toughest dudes on the planet. And with one hand, Henry can just go and just shove the guy to the ground. That's amazing to me. And Darnell Washington is like the new version of that. Like Bosa is a beast. And Darnell Washington put him in a locker. Like that's crazy to me. That's crazy to me. Uh, that's football is a fascinating sport because there are guys who make certain feats of strength look easy when I think what we're all wise enough to know it's nowhere near as easy as they make them look. B.A.'s cardigan said I had some sound effects. Yeah, I guess I did have a little sound effect there. Uh, let's see what else. Thirty twenty Delmar Lane having some fun over here. Uh, yeah, a lot of excuses coming out of Tuscaloosa these days. Frank Patterson said, apparently I didn't see Chubb versus the Eagles. I apologize. I, I know that there's a little bit of controversy coming out of Cleveland for a minute. Um... I don't fully know. I didn't follow this all that well, but I guess like Chubb wasn't named like one of the Browns captains. I guess there was a little bit of controversy around that. People were, some people up there were a little bit mad about that. Uh, Jimbo Slice Bread says, back-to-back national champs, haven't lost a regular season game since the COVID year, number one in recruiting for both 24 and 25. He says, Georgia is the current standard. All else is cope. Jimbo, I love that. That's good stuff. That is very good stuff. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Augusta Bourne says, Bama fans have lost their minds. Best to leave them in their misery. Yeah, it's a tough time to be a Bama fan here these days. Nature Gator mentioning the idea of Deion Sanders becoming the next coach at Alabama. I don't know what Deion's next move is. I mean, you would as- assume that he's probably not looking to stay at Colorado forever, right? Because, I mean, I mean, you know, historically speaking, Colorado's been a pretty tough place to get players. And eventually, you kind of want to move in that direction. I know there's been some chatter lately about, you know, would Dion go to the NFL? And I guess he probably could, and perhaps he will. I mean, obviously, he's one of the all-time great NFL players. But to me, there's something about Dion's message that I think really resonates as a college coach. To me, Dion looks like someone who really enjoys helping raise up, like, you know, younger men. Now, Some of that may be a byproduct of that's also the phase of life that his own children are in. And perhaps, you know, that desire to kind of shape these kind of people who are similar age to his kids, maybe that kind of dissipates a little bit when they get older, maybe move on on to the NFL and just being a professional coach. Maybe he would consider doing that. But, you know, just given the way that, you know, Dion kind of, you know, does a lot of this kind of stuff, I mean, doesn't it seem like that message kind of resonates in college in a special way? And look, like Dion very aggressive in the transfer portal, you know, wants to win some recruiting battles. There's an element to which like NFL talent acquisition, restrictive free agency rules, restrictive draft rules, you know, for the coaches in college, and I'd put, you know, Dion the same category of some of these other really successful college coaches, like the talent acquisition process in college is a lot more open. And so to an aggressive, hard driving person, I've always said that college is actually a better deal for you because NFL only lets you spend so much money in free agency, only lets you draft so many players. In college football, you can go out and get 25 first-round picks if you want to. And uh, that's kind of what Dion's sort of done. Antoine Sampson says, the legend taught King Kirby everything he uh, knows, and Kirby's nothing without Saban's teaching. How is it Saban hasn't taught anyone anything else after Kirby left? Can you enlighten me, please, B.A.? Yeah, Antoine, what is Antoine saying there is, sarcastically there are some people who believe that everything that Kirby's done is a byproduct of the influence of Nick Saban and yet for whatever reason that influence has not really extended anybody else all these other coaches that he supposedly worked with I think that's a very good point and something I have harped on a lot and I do believe that one day more people will consider in the post Kirby Smart world at Alabama the Alabama program has just been a different type of program it just has been I mean, think about the two national championships they've won since Kirby Smart left. One of those in 20, was in 2017. That was just Kirby's second year at Georgia, and 
Georgia came within an eyelash of beating them. Now, Alabama fans love to kind of rub it in Georgia's face. Ah, second 26, second 26, ha, 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 ha. But Kirby, year two as a head coach, not year two at Georgia, year two as a head coach, because by the time the Nick Saban got to Alabama, he'd been a head coach for decades. Um, Year two as a head coach, Kirby Smart came within an eyelash of beating Nick Saban then. Didn't happen, but it came within an eyelash of happening then. And then the next national championship they won, pandemic year of 2020. And y'all, how much evidence do you need to see that 2020 does not count? Who became a football hero in 2020? Zach Wilson. How good is Zach Wilson? You saw on Monday night. Zach Wilson became the number two overall pick in the NFL draft because of what he did in college football in 2020 playing for BYU. But like everything else in 2020, none of it counts. Texas A&M was in the top five that year. They haven't been close to that since then. Florida won the East that year. Haven't been close to that since then. Kyle Trask, big star in 2020, floundering on the bench in Tampa, can't even beat out Baker Mayfield. Nothing that happened in 2020 has had any staying power or any relevance since then, including Alabama's national championship, by the way. Bama first became a 40-point-per-game offense in 2018. The only national championship they won as a 40-plus-per-game offense was, once again, in the panic gimmick year of uh, of 2020. And the other years, the softer defense allowed them to give up 40-plus points to Clemson. They got blown out. Gave up 50 to LSU, lost at home. You know, you, you've just sort of seen – Alabama make a big switch, a big trade to become more like this and less like that. And I'm sorry, the trade just did not work out. Bama, with Kirby Smart as defensive coordinator, playing a more sound version of football, it was far more successful, far more successful to the tune of championships and things like that, far more successful than what it's been the last few years. The numbers could not be any less clear or any more clear. Paul Moon also mentioned losing Steve Sarkeesian. Yeah, no doubt that Sark, I believe, was the best play caller that Alabama's had, but I also believe he benefited from a situation which defenses just were not very good. Um, all right. Uh, Nature Gator says Kyle Trask is not floundering in Tampa Bay. He had a great preseason. Free Kyle Trask. There you go. Uh, Nature Gator is a Kyle Trask truther. Um, all right. Uh, let DMR42 says replacing him with Bill O'Brien was the killer. The players hate that guy. Yeah, I mean, like low key, Nick Saban was very good at hiring offensive coordinators because, you know, like Lane Kiffin had been this transformational figure for that program. But the next offensive coordinator he hired was Brian Dable. Like Dable went on to, you know, so far, Brian Dable is the only guy that's really kind of figured things out with, with Josh Allen. That's another one of these NFL stories that's worth following here is that Allen in kind of a post-Brian Dable world has not looked like the same same quarterback, did not certainly look that way on Monday Night Football. The absence of Dable's made a big difference. Well, nobody, who, nobody really knew who Brian Dable was until Nick Saban hired him. Saban hires him. He has a good you know run there, goes on to Buffalo, becomes offense coordinator. Now he's head coach of the New York Giants. Uh, you know, Saban hired Mike Loxley. Loxley's now, uh, you know, head coach with the Maryland uh, Terrapins. You know, you know, had Sarkeesian kind of waiting the wings, but low key, Saban for a while had a very good run of offensive coordinators. But eventually, you just sort of run out of easy buttons to push or diamonds in the rough to find. Bill O'Brien was not the same caliber of offensive coordinator. Tommy Reese definitely is not the same caliber of offensive coordinator. I don't believe. Uh, and eventually, your ability to kind of re, you know, keep hiring guys over and over and over again. Um, it just, your luck kind of runs out eventually. It's one of the reasons why I don't make as big a deal about like say Mike Bobo. Some Georgia fans have been concerned about that. I, a, I believe that Bobo is probably a better offensive quarter than some of y'all do, but B, I think some of this also kind of comes down to, well, if not Bobo, who would you have gone out and gotten, you know, they're just not, there is not like some long list of great offensive coordinators just sort of be waiting to be hired. Uh, Alabama and Tommy Reese kind of proves that. Uh, Thomas Dyson talking about the picture of Reese where he's like got his head down like this. Uh, PFT commenter looked like he, he looked like he was calling his parents from jail. Uh, that's that's really pretty funny. Really pretty funny. Uh, all right, last comments. David West checking out. Appreciate that. Good to see Philip Jordan Wells in here as always. Um, 
Oh, yeah, what is the Thursday game tonight? Are the Eagles on TV tonight? Is that right? Yeah, Vikings-Eagles tonight. That's fun. That's fun. Uh, Amazon Prime. Make sure you can find that. Uh, that's good stuff. Good stuff. All right, we're going to go for right now. Y'all have a great day. Uh, thanks for being here for our R.S. Andrews cool down. Y'all find them online, rsandrews.com, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They will show up on time. They'll do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. You can trust them on all of that. We'll see you back here tomorrow for Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. We will talk to you then.